So what are nanomaterials? What we're really looking at are objects with very, very, very small dimensions in the nanoscale. So a nanometer is one, one times 10 to the minus nine meters. So very, very small. So what? <laughs> what why, why the interest? What, what, why bother actually going and making uh, objects a bit uh, this small? Well, the thing that really went and kicked off nanotechnology is uh, Richard Feynman, the extremely uh, famous uh, physicist, um, or for those people that watch the Big Bang Theory, the person that Sheldon always goes on about, um, spoke at Caltech in 1959 with a paper that uh, referred to a uh, statement, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he was really looking at is the potential of actually building structures atom by atom upwards. So you're actually almost, as he called it, swallowing the doctor. Uh, actually having something within the body itself that has been built up and can actually do a variety of um, operations, almost having machinery of that size. When we're down at this level of size, we start having quantum effects starting to take over rather than what we'd call Newtonian effects, which we see with bulk substances. So when you have a bulk substance, you end up having a, a large amount of averaging out of all the quantum effects. So you end up just seeing things like uh, continua, where you have... Um, almost like, a, say, if you talk about uh, application of a force and how it accelerates. We're looking at Newtonian um, uh, particular operations, which are a continuum, you can do mass. Whereas quantum, you're, you're looking at particular specific energy gaps, where something happens at one energy, or it happens at another energy, and you don't actually have anything happening at an energy in between. So you actually have it much more stepwise. When we start talking at... Uh, nanomaterials, we're starting to go in the area where quantum effects actually start taking over and it can start having some quite interesting effects. Um, so the other issue around nanomaterials, which is really what uh, kicks in when we're talking about uh, safety, is very high surface area to volume ratio. And also the percentage of atoms that actually appear at the surface of uh, a molecule is very, very high. So one issue is, as I say, chemistry occurs on the surface, you get increased reactivity because of the increased surface area. Also, because you've got very constrained small particles, you actually have much more strain in a bond uh, at, for molecules at the surface, which makes them more reactive as well compared to, say, a bulk substance. So one of the activity, uh, examples here is the biocidal activity of nanosilver. So people who have socks that have antimicrobial, I don't know if anyone's wearing socks with antimicrobial properties, um, supposedly you don't have to go and wash them, although them, I'd, I'd, anyone who does that, I would warn you that most of the nanosilver is washed out after about five goes. Uh, there was a conference last year where people were looking at use, use of nano copper oxide um, to be used as a, um, a plant nutrient. If you apply copper oxide, because it much more, absorbs much more strongly to soil, really the, the, um, you've got a fairly consistent concentration of copper in the soil. So that's what they're looking at here. These quantum effects I was talking about before, we start looking at things like quantum dots, which are used in high-end um, uh, televisions. The other area is colourless sunscreen. I'm sure many of you may well have gone to Australia perhaps 20 years ago and you slapped on the zinc cream and it's a huge big white smear. Whereas now you can get colourless sunscreen, which is just as effective, but it doesn't leave huge white smears all over you. So what's the issue around biological systems? Well, one of the issues around biological systems is that nanomaterials can get to places that other substances can't. So you may well get situations where the iron isn't able to pass um, the cell membrane, but the particle is. Once it's within the cell, then it can start releasing its ions actually within the cell. And so you can start getting biological effects that you wouldn't have seen with other forms of the same substance. Other issue is they're very, very small. That means they can get into parts of, say, your lungs or perhaps pass through your skin that other substances can't. This is a key issue with asbestosis. I've already talked about this, what's known as a Trojan horse mechanism, where you transport toxic chemicals into cells, which perhaps you wouldn't have expected. Other issue we have with nanosized particles is they, they have a particular uh, behavior. I've already said they have a large surface area, they have a large surface energy. They like to get rid of the energy. So actually, in reality, you don't often get individual particles just floating around on the nanoparticle scale. What they'll do is they'll clump together into what's known as agglomerates or aggregates to go and reduce the energy. Or 
they'll end up with either a deliberate coating, if we deliberately put one on, or be coated with environmental um, or biological um, molecules such as proteins or humic acids, that side of things. So they end up, you'll end up almost with a, what I call, like I call a gobstopper uh, type effect. And of course, you can start going and getting degradation of large particles into small particles. What's the problem with this is that each one can have a different hazard profile. So we're now going to hit onto our regulatory part. I've given you a bit of a description of a nanomaterial, but obviously everything with regulations, you end up, you have a formal definition. And this is what's used within REACH. A lot of it actually is what most global regulations are using. So we can already see it's a lovely definition and it's almost the one that's most difficult to prove. Key thing to note here is there is no nano-specific regulation in Europe, and there isn't an, I haven't seen a nano-specific regulation anywhere else in the world. What you have is the regulations really look, cover uses, substances that are used for certain things, and what you'll actually find is within these regulations, nanomaterials are regarded as falling under the general description. So what's happened? REACH has been revised. What's it going to mean, this uh, REACH update? What's going to require is that particle characterization is going to be compulsory and it's going to be required for each similar set of nanoforms. You're not going to be able to do full-scale toxicological testing on every single nanoform. It's, frankly, it's not going to be ethical because of the amount of animal testing and no, it'll make nanotechnology not financially viable. How do you get around this is to use read across and grouping. So it's these, as Alex said, these ways of reducing testing costs. So saying, I can use this data from existing data, I can apply it to my nanoform, and here's a scientific justification of why I can. Thank you very much for your attention.